Okay, so I'm going to do a quick run through. Um, these will be a different in a different order depending on the version of the test that you took. Um, the first one placed in the order of increasing lattice energy. The um, I think we did this on the very first day for chapter nine, but lattice energy is proportional to the charge on ion one times the charge on ion two divided by the distance between them. And so the substance with the weakest lattice energy is the one with the smallest charges, lithium iodide. Then barium sulfide, magnesium oxide, both have plus two, minus two charges. But magnesium oxide, those are smaller atoms. They're up farther on the periodic table, and therefore they can get close to together. In other words, D is smaller for magnesium oxide, which makes it the um, strongest lattice. All right, the next one, uh, of course, you always try to minimize formal charge as long as all the atoms have an octet. And although all the atoms do have an octet in this Lewis structure, um, there are also form, form, formal charges. So this is the preferred structure. Um, when I was working out this problem, the Born-Haber cycle, um, I realized that the um, lattice energy expression was written backwards, and my intention was not is never purposely to trick you. So lattice energy should have been written like this, and therefore the lattice energy instead of plus 717 should have been minus 717. The bottom line is I gave everyone credit on this question because of that, um, but if you'd like to see how it would properly be worked out in case there's anything funky like this in the ACS final, this is the work. All right, so the answer, the correct answer to that was minus 437 kilojoules, but again, I gave everybody credit for that one. All right, which one of the following statements is false? Um, and that would be A, um, electrons are transferred, that is true for ionic bonds. They are only shared for covalent bonds, so A is not true for all bonds. Um, let's see, this one, if you go through the lowest structure rules of counting electrons, distribute them like you're supposed to, you find that you get a structure like this. The electron geometry is tetrahedral because there are four domains. One, two, three, four. Um, molecular geometry is when you ignore the lone pairs, and so that then would be trigonal pyramidal. The next one, Vesper theory, says valence shell, electron pair repulsion, and that is valence shell. In other words, core electrons, I don't believe, have a significant effect on the geometry of a molecule. Best Lewis structure for the cation of nitrogen monoxide is this one. Uh, it's the only lowest structure you can come up with where both atoms have an octet. I noticed that some of you drew, uh, I'm trying to remember what you did draw. Let's see. Two, four, six, eight. I think, yeah, some of you drew that. Um, that's not acceptable because in this structure, nitrogen does not have an octet. It only has six around it. So. Um, you have to try to give everything an octet if you can. Okay, the next one, um, CS2, is just like CO2. So if you draw the Lewis structure, you notice that it is, in fact, linear. Um, and although each of the individual bonds are polar, the dipoles cancel out. They go in totally opposite directions. And so overall, the molecule is nonpolar. All right, PCL3, um, when you're trying to decide what has the partial positive charge and what has the partial negative charge, you 
simply give the more electronegative atoms the partial negative charge. Okay, so phosphorus would actually have the partial positive charge. The Lewis structure for xenon iodide is here. Notice it has three sets of lone pairs around the xenon, which is funky, but that is the way it looks. Um, equivalent resonance forms for uh, the carbonate ion. Anytime you can rotate a double bond to equivalent atoms around a central atom, you want to do so. And since there are three oxygens around carbon, there are three resonance structures. Okay, the next one, calculate enthalpy of reaction using bond association energies. And so um, you just have to tally up all the bonds broken and subtract from that the sum of all of the bonds made. And some things I noticed while I was grading them, um, some of you forgot to multiply the bond energy for two. If you look at the balanced reaction, you see you have two hydrochlorics and two hydrofluorics. So you gotta multiply the bond energies by two. Um, let's see. And so you get 1,017 minus 1,376. So it's minus 359 kilojoules is the right answer. And, all right. This was the one I think that said arrange them in order of increasing polarity. And um, bond polarity is determined by um, the difference in electronegativity between two atoms that are making a bond. And so if you look in the periodic table, electronegativity trend does that. So if you're looking for more polar bonds, you want the difference in electronegativity to be as large as possible. So the bottom line is the farther away two atoms are um, uh, from each other in the periodic table, um, the more polar the bond will be that they make. And if you think about ionic bonds, they have one nonmetal, right, and one metal. So ionic bonds are the most polar type of bond. Um, so the correct answer, oxygen and fluorine are closest to each other in the periodic table, so there's going to be a relatively small electronegativity difference for that. On the other hand, magnesium and fluorine are on opposite ends in the periodic table, and so that will be quite a polar bond. All right, so the next one was mainly, um, well, if you counted your electrons correctly, um, some of you tried to put a lone pair on the boron. Um, there aren't enough valence electrons. There are only 24. Um, and so there are none left over to put in the middle, which is fine because it turns out the boron is one of those exceptions to the octet rule, and it is stable with only six electrons around it. So this is the um, correct Lewis dot structure. Since it only has three areas of electron density around it, whoops, um, it's going to be a trigonal planar for both geometries. Okay, sorry about that. Um, this is a potential iod potential energy diagram showing two atoms bonding, in this case two hydrogen atoms. Um, this might have, I think that was probably the very first thing I went over when I got on the bonding chapter. But when bonds form, um, the reason they form the driving force is because it lowers the overall potential energy of the system, making it more stable. So if you see this type of bond energy graph, you want to look for the lowest point on the graph. And then I'm going to try to ignore that barking for a minute. And then um, the bond length is the um, distance between the two atoms at the lowest point. And bond energy is the energy that these two atoms have at their lowest point. Alrighty, so here's free response. Let's see if I can well, the bonus spilled over to the next page. 
All right, so, and I must say, I, I warned you repeatedly during lecture to, to be careful for this, so it was kind of hopeful that more people would get this one than actually did, but um, sodium oxide. Um, so, several of you put S for sodium, S is sulfur. Anyway, sodium is Na. Um, it's a metal, and so this is an ionic compound. So that was the most important thing to realize because ionic compounds do not share electrons. You don't draw a conventional Lewis structure or uh, like molecular shape Lewis structures and stuff. So um, I said show how it forms. So you would draw the neutral sodium atom, which only has one valence electron, a neutral oxygen atom, um, which has six, and um, then you draw once the sodium transfers um, electrons to the oxygen, you end up with a Lewis dot structure for the ionic compound that looks like this, where the cation is naked, no valence electrons around it, you gotta make sure you show its charge, and the anion, the oxygen anion, like all anions, are shown with eight valence electrons around them. The next free response um, is PF3 and PF5. PF3 has a lone pair on the phosphorus. PF5 is, uh, phosphorus has expanded its octet to hold two, four, six, eight, ten electrons. Um, the shapes, um, the PF3 has four areas of electron density around it. So its electron geometry is tetrahedral. Um, molecular geometry, you ignore the lone pairs, and so the molecular geometry is trigonal pyramidal. I want to point out, some of you said trigonal planar. Um, it's not, that's not true. So the, if it starts as tetrahedral and has one lone pair, it's always trigonal middle. And PF5, since it has five areas of electron density around it, it is trigonal bipyramidal. And since there are no lone pairs on the central atom, the geometry shape is also trigonal bipyramidal. And that's true with any geometries. If you have no lone pairs in the central atom, that means the elect so here let wait a minute. So if you have no lone pairs on the central atom, that means the electron geometry equals the molecular geometry. They're one and the same. So it's only when you have lone pairs that they change. Okay, identify the polarity of each of them. Fluorine is more polar than phosphorus. Um, and so the partial positive charge goes over phosphorus. This molecule as a whole is polar um, because it's not symmetric. I mean, you have a lone pair of electrons on the top and then fluorine atoms making a tripod on the bottom, so it is not symmetric. Um, PF5, on the other hand, that's a completely symmetric structure because you have fluorine straight up and straight down and those dipoles cancel and then you have three more fluorine one going back into the page one coming out at the page and one going off to the side and believe it or not these three fluorines are identically equally spaced and so they also um, have dipoles that all cancel out with each other. So net-net, this molecule is completely symmetric, and therefore it is nonpolar. The hybridization, when you have four areas of electron density like PF3, you need four orbitals, um, one for each of the four areas. So. You have an S and you have 3P for a total of four orbitals. The hybridization for PF5, it has five areas of electron density, so you need five orbitals. So one S and you have three Ps for a total of four, well, for four, plus one D for five. 
All right, and that's the bonus. So, um, I was really, the reason I gave this, I know some of you were upset because I didn't give you the Sigma and Pi, but the Sigma and Pi will show up on your ACS final. I've seen it. Um, I actually thought this would be easier for, mo for most of you being able to do this. Um, plus, I hadn't really asked much about bond angles on the bulk test, so I wanted to see what you guys knew about that. Um, so this is the correct identification of all of them. The end one is SP3. The next two are SP2. And the last two are SP. That's it.